Welcome to The Career Studio, a USU career services podcast that helps you navigate your career path. Thanks so much for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armistead, your host, and I'm so excited to have Sierra Stevens, a dear friend and colleague of mine here with me today. Sierra, thanks so much for being here. Marissa, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, Sierra earned her bachelor's degree from Florida Gulf Coast University in communication and public relations. She minored in political science and interdisciplinary studies. She has experience in advising, marketing, residential counseling, legislative advocacy and policy work, and most recently, career and professional development. She is currently working for the University of Utah as a career coach and is also pursuing her master's degree in higher education, leadership, and policy. So Sierra, before we get started, you mentioned that you know science language. And I have to learn a little bit more about this experience. I was actually thinking back and I saw a video, I think it was maybe on social media, of you performing sign language to a song. And so I want to learn more about this experience. When did you first start learning? Yeah, absolutely. So I took a class my freshman year of high school. Um, I was introduced to it because the same organization that you saw the video from, it's called HANDS, which stands for Helping America Notice Deaf Society. Um, They used to do these big annual performances. And I went my first time when I was in eighth grade, I was like 13 years old, and I thought it was the coolest thing. And all the ticket proceeds go straight to a deaf community in South Florida. And I just knew when I got to high school, that was something I wanted to be a part of. I studied it um, from nine to 12th grade for about four years and it was it's lovely it's a beautiful language I'm I'm still learning I'm still practicing all the time but I'm really thankful to know the bits that I do very cool and I'm curious is there anything you've learned from that experience of learning a new language yeah absolutely I think language is so powerful like any whatever language you're speaking but it's it just makes you think about the way that you express yourself and especially with sign language the format is very different it's like time object, subject, verb, and then there's no like ING. So it would be like, tomorrow school I go. It's kind of like people have compared it to Yoda talk. And I don't really want to say that it's like Yoda talk, but people have said it's similar to that. So it's just very interesting conveying like metaphors or just like exaggerations in sign language because it's such a literal language. So yeah, it definitely was very eye-opening. I've considered being a translator like a million times, but I also don't know if that's what's going to (laughs) happen. No, that's awesome. And and I guess it stood out to me because it made me think back to when I was in elementary school and I had a friend who was deaf. And so the whole class, for whatever reason, they, they let the whole class learn sign language. And it was something they just kind of incorporated into our curriculum, but it stuck with me. And to this day, I still, I think I can do at least do the alphabet. And I just remember that experience was really eye-opening and to really put yourself in the shoes of somebody who doesn't have the same experience that you have on a day-to-day basis yeah. was just really eye-opening. So I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely, I think that's kind of where, I think that might've been like my first introduction to like injustices. Like, of course you're aware of it throughout your life as you're growing up and you see others. But for me as like a white privileged woman, like I, it wasn't something I faced on an everyday basis. I'm able-bodied. So that was like my, I feel my first introduction to working with like a community who was underserved and underrepresented. And I definitely think it was like a jumping off point for a lot of my passion today. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm getting goosebumps already. And we're going to dive even more into this. So thank you for sharing that. Let's go ahead and move into kind of our topic. So this month, we're really looking at ways that students and potentially even alumni can broaden their career horizons. And something really interesting that you mentioned earlier was that you are a first generation student. And so I'm really curious to learn more about this experience. And I guess maybe to start, talk to us about some of the reasons or barriers maybe that your parents faced and why they didn't choose to go to college or weren't able to. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, it's always interesting when I reflect on my first generation college student identity because I never really thought much of it. I didn't think that it was significant or different than anybody else because I just didn't know any better. All of my parents' work friends didn't go to college either because that's just kind of like the, the career field that they're in. My mom works in law enforcement and my dad works in like construction, insulation kind of things. Not a lot of my aunt and uncles went to college. Like it wasn't, it just wasn't something that we did really. But I was super fortunate that I grew up my entire life, my parents telling me that I was going to be going to college, that I was going to have a better life than they did and be able to provide more. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely like shaped to me a lot in 
ways that I never even, I didn't even know what that term was probably until like my sophomore, junior year of college. And then that aha moment of like, that's why this has been so hard. Like, that's why this has been so different from like my peers who have parents that went to college or whatever, because I love my parents and they have provided for me as much as they humanly possibly can. They were pretty much like, you're on your own for college in terms of like the application process and then committing to an institution and and just like navigating that. And as someone who's like studying higher education, like I am very aware of how like inaccessible our system is in the United States. So I'm like, that's something I'm very proud of that I was able to graduate in four years. That's not a very high statistic for first generation college students. And it's because of that lack of like information and resources that are shared with them. So yeah, absolutely. Well, and thank you so much for sharing that. I know this is a really vulnerable subject, so I really appreciate your openness to talk about these things and hopefully give hope to other students who are maybe facing some of those same challenges. I'm curious to know a little bit more. So this was a new experience. You really didn't have a ton of support in terms of people in your life had really done this before. So what was something that motivated you? Why did you want to attend and get a college degree? Um, I really think my parents like telling me my whole life that I was like going to college with something. And I also have an older sister who attended the university that was in Miami. So not too far from home. So she stayed at home. So I kind of like saw the experience that she was getting commuting to her institution daily. And Miami traffic is like really not, it is really (laughs) awful. So I just was like thinking about what this experience was going to be for me. Like, did I want to do the commute? to Miami? Did I want to go further away? Like what was going to be the option there? And then my parents also like, again, provided as much as they could. They covered, thankfully, a majority of my tuition with like Florida prepaid, but they had let me know that they weren't going to be able to help with housing. And that kind of was on my own. So now I'm deciding like, all right, if I go away to college, like I have to figure this out because $800 a month in rent as an 18 year old is like, a lot. Terrifying. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Exactly. So I I had to really think about it, but all of my peers were going to like outstanding institutions. And um, I, like, I knew I was going to college. Like it really wasn't even a question. And I feel really privileged and grateful that that was like the mindset that I was in for all of my life. So yeah, it wasn't necessarily a question of like, if I'm going to college, it was kind of like a where and how was I going to make it happen? (laughs) Absolutely. I'm glad to hear that you had some support, if not anything else, moral support to make it there. So that's half the battle. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. With those things in mind, I'd love to explore a little bit more about your education experience and particularly kind of what led you to where you're currently at. So maybe let's go back in time just a little bit, maybe back to your undergraduate experience. Talk to us about some of the clubs, the organizations, departments that you were involved with as an undergrad student. Yeah, absolutely. So in high school, that older sister that I mentioned, um, she was really involved in student government and I would volunteer with her while I was still in middle school even. And she would introduce me to um, different teachers and different advisors and things like that. So by the time I got to high school, I pretty much was like destined to be involved, but um, I, I took it to the next level and I would do Future Educators of America. I was part of debate. I got involved in sign language. I did drama club. Like I literally tried like everything, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) Um, So I had always enjoyed just being around and being engaged in the high school community. And so when I got to college, I remember I was at orientation with my dad and all the orientation leaders just looked like so much fun. Like they looked like they were living their best lives. And I like looked over at my dad and I was like, I'm going to be an orientation leader one day. Like, look how much fun they're having. And he's like, yeah, okay. Like have fun. (laughs) He was just like, sure. Sounds good. Um, And he was used to me doing all of those things. So it wasn't like a surprise to him. When I got to college, I remember there were applications for orientation leaders and I was literally had been on campus for like a month by the time they started that process. And I thankfully somehow they hired me and I spent my first summer as an orientation leader, um, just welcoming new students. And I just always remember relating my experience to theirs as I wanted to make sure that they knew that being uncomfortable and worried and nervous was completely normal. Like they were not the only ones that were like, what the heck am I getting? myself into. And I think everybody kind of feels that way as a first year student, but especially those first generation college students. And at this time, I really didn't realize that that was part of my identity, but I still was kind of like, like I would say it without using the term first gen. I would just be like, yeah, I'm the first in my like family as well. So we like really don't know what's going on. So yeah, I think that involvement and then orientation leader like kind of spiraled into becoming a resident assistant. 
And then that spiraled into like student government. And then all of that obviously is like student affairs, very student affairs-esque. So then I got involved into like students interested in student affairs. And we would go to like NASPA conferences, which is the like nation's student affairs professional association. So, so yeah, I definitely think like my involvement for me, it was fun, but I, I, upon reflecting, I realized it was because I genuinely felt like I was helping people feel like they belonged and that like we could connect and then get through it together kind of thing, if that makes sense. So I feel like that is what has brought me to studying higher education. And while it started as wanting to get involved as a student affairs practitioner, and I still do feel that way, I long-term think that I want to get involved in the policy because I can help students work through the higher education system like on the front end. I, I feel positive policy really makes like such a huge difference in terms of how the education system works. So that is something I'm very interested in like getting a little more involved in just to kind of make that wider impact, I suppose, instead of just at the institution I'm working. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences. And I really love how you illustrate how each thing that you were involved with kind of led to the next. And had you been scared or afraid to start something new, you wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be thinking about students. You wouldn't necessarily be thinking about policy work. And so I really, really love just, yeah, walking through that process of, of seeing those different experiences and how they translate to where you are. Thank you for sharing that. I love yes, that. Thank you for giving me the space to share. I'm, I feel so thankful. Oh, good. <laughs> Well, Sierra, I know that you've done a fair amount of volunteering in your time. Can you talk to us about some of the organizations that you have volunteered for? And again, kind of relate that to how that's impacted your career choices. Yeah, totally. So oddly enough, I feel like my volunteer experiences have been kind of more just like fulfilling and meaningful because I am, they're not necessarily in places that I wanted to pursue professionally. And I think volunteering helped me figure that out. So I, from a young age, had did, um, volunteered with like Meals on Wheels with my grandmother through her church. And that was, I don't know if you're familiar with that organization, but they just like deliver meals to older people who can't leave their home. Mm -hmm. And then I've always like volunteered for my town. Like we have events and things like that. And then when I got to college, my undergraduate institution required 80 hours of service learning. And while I always advised my peers, I'm like, volunteer in things you think you're interested in. I kind of just was like, I like animals, but I don't want to be a veterinarian. So I'm going to like, I, <laughs> I volunteered at Shy Wolf Sanctuary and that's like such a Florida thing, but we have these wolves that people try to bring into captivity and obviously it didn't really work out because they're not domestic animals. And so eventually they get sent to the sanctuary to be taken care of for the rest of their lives. So I kind of use my volunteering as like, like hobby things that I was like, I'm interested in this and I like being around this and I like helping, but it's not an extreme like passion of mine. Like I don't plan on being a veterinarian or anything. So does that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that brings up a really good point because sometimes students feel like, you know, this, this idea of passion gets tossed around a lot. And I think we forget that we don't have to be paid to do something that is fulfilling to us and vice yeah. versa. We can get paid to do something that is fulfilling. And so I, I like that you acknowledge different areas of your life and how not every piece has to be connected. So right. I actually really like that perspective. I think that's helpful. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Don't get me wrong. I've had my fair share of like unpaid internships that have definitely shaped me as well, but I don't really qualify that as volunteering because I think that that is like internship work. So it's always an interesting fine line that I find people like talk about. They're like, well, it's unpaid, so you're technically a volunteer. And I'm like, I guess, but it's the experience is so much different because there are different expectations and there's different worth, work ethics when you're do, dealing with those two like titles, I guess. Um, good clarification between the two because they are different. I guess I have a broader question that kind of reflects on all, everything we've been talking about. But as you look back on these experiences, what has been a key motivator for you personally to try things that were out of your comfort zone? Because again, you, you, reflecting back, you've, you've done lots of different things. And I'm guessing there was probably some nerves you know, involved for trying those different things. So talk to us about some of your motivation. Yeah. To be completely transparent, I went to my career in professional development center, my undergrad one time before I started working in this office. So I was like not the best in terms of, of seeking advice for that kind of thing. But now as a career coach, like I would be, <laughs> I would be like one of those students that you talk to and they're like, I just like everything. And you're like, okay, well you need to like 
pick, <laughs> pick, like just narrow in a little bit. I'm glad you like everything, but is there anything that brings like extra joy? So I think a lot of those experiences, like I truly enjoy being able to channel different parts of like my personality and my creativity. So while my undergraduate degree is in communication and public relations, and I, I love thinking about campaigns, like that excites me. I think that's so cool. But I think long term, I'm just more passionate about like social justice and education and equality and equity. So it's just kind of like, I have all these interests and they motivate me to want to try it out and see what I think because I'm like a firm believer, like you don't know unless you try. Some experiences have definitely been like, yeah, no, I don't like that. But some of them, most of them have been like, that was enjoyable. So it just kind of comes down to me having to prioritize where my genuine like interest and passion is. But yeah, I think just liking everything (laughs) is kind of like a motivator because I was like, all right, I got to figure this out. So it helped me experience those things more in depth instead of them just kind of being like this surface dream that I love. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's, that's a really interesting perspective. I really like that. And okay. So one more thing I I have to ask before a final question, you have done a ton of traveling. And so maybe you can give us a brief (laughs) overview of some of the amazing places you've traveled. So we'll start there. Where, where have you traveled? Yes, totally. So again, I'm very fortunate that my mom, my whole life was like pretty, pretty into traveling. She would always like take us road tripping road tripping Florida is truly miserable. It takes like nine (laughs) hours to get out of the state. Um, But once you do, you get to what we call the mountains, which is like Georgia, North Carolina. It's Mm -hmm. like rolling hills. So she would always take us there on during like the fall and so we can experience it. So I think it's something that I grew up with it being like normal and fun and cool. So it kind of eased a lot of those like sometimes anxieties that people have when it comes to traveling. So my grandma is um, an immigrant from Ireland and she came to America when she's 21 years old with like $20 in her pocket and just growing up around her stories and meals and experience of like the Irish culture. I always have like loved Ireland and I had, I had never been until 2017. And when I went with my mom and sister for spring break, I was like, I would love to live here. Like I want to experience this as not like just a tourist, but as someone who's like truly staying here. So while I was like looking for internships because I needed one to graduate, someone but somebody mentioned like, why don't you just do your internship in Ireland? Because it wouldn't be studying abroad. Because studying abroad, there was no way I could afford that. Like it was impossible. And they're like, but you could take your classes online and then just do an internship in person and get to stay there. And I was like, okay, sure. So (laughs) I rolled up to Ireland completely by myself, and I had two internships there, and I stayed there for like the latter half of 2018 and I was back before Christmas and it was just such a really, it was a really beautiful experience and I think it really shaped how I view the world and how I view life around me and knowing nobody while before I went over there, I pretty much was like, thankfully I, I, as you can probably tell, I'm very extroverted, but it was kind of like a, if you want to make friends, like you have to go do it because otherwise you're going to spend these months in your bedroom by yourself because you don't know anybody here. So, so I think like that traveling experience or a living abroad experience really sparked like a lot in me. And that was the first time that I had the opportunity to travel to different European countries, like going to Italy and France. And it was all with these people that I met while I was in Ireland. Cause I just would like go up to them and ask you if they wanted to be friends. And then like <laughs> later, like we're still friends today. So I'm, I'm glad they didn't think I was like totally crazy. Cause it definitely was, but you know, that's okay. So I, I just think that it has given me such an appreciation and it really, I feel it just teaches me so much. Like I, I think everybody, if they they can and are able and want to travel, should should do it. I think it's really beneficial to see how different things operate. Even being in Utah is so different from Florida. Different culture, you can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> it is like polar opposites. Like Miami, Florida, Spanish is more more commonly spoken there than English. And while I'm not fluent in Spanish, it definitely was a culture that I was very familiar with and comfortable with. And then coming to Utah, not really having anything like that has been almost like a culture shock in itself. But it's good for me to like see these different types of cultures and ways of living. So yeah, that was a really long tangent, but... No, that was a great tangent. I loved it. (laughs) So many nuggets in there. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. And we're just about out of time, but I do want to ask one final question. Yes. And that question is, if you had one piece of advice for students or really just people who want to broaden their career horizons, what would it be? It's hard for me to say this because I know it's not as easy as what I'm about to say, but if you can and are able and are comfortable, like I really, truly recommend like 
trying anything, trying your dreams, trying something you think you might be slightly interested, but you're not sure, like just putting yourself out there and kind of figuring it out is probably one of the best ways to really narrow in on what you're interested in. And I recognize that that can be like a privileged way of thinking. And I just am like, I, it has really opened my, my eyes and it has kind of taken me out of this pigeonhole and has showed me that there's so much more to life into the world and coming from like my parents who don't really know anything about like college or people with college degrees or whatever like I think me having this experience has shown me like that I can kind of figure it out on my own and and decide what what I'm truly passionate about so if you are interested in anything even if you're scared do it I think I think it can benefit I think growth comes outside of your comfort zone. And I think it's really important to reflect along the way and ask yourself, like, why am I, if I'm nervous, like, why am I nervous? If I'm excited, why? Like, what, what is making me feel this way? Because that is kind of when, where you'll get down to like the nitty gritty of your passions and your interests and, and your comfort, comfortability <laughs> um, <laughs> with, of, with those things. So I know, again, that's really long winded, but I think if there's something you're interested in, try it out. Absolutely. And and I think some students are worried about failure and oh, yeah. failure can only happen if you try, but success can only happen if you try too. So right. I really appreciate that perspective of just getting out there and, yeah. and who knows, seeing what happens. I kind of always joke and I'm like, just try it. And like the worst that happens is like you like it and you find a job for the rest of your life. <laughs> like, no big deal. You know I mean? Yeah, right. I'm like, the, the worst that happens is you decide you really love this and this is it. Like this is the one, you know, otherwise you just keep looking and go to the next one. Like, <laughs> Life is short, and I think the generation before us, and maybe maybe it's just my viewpoint of the generation before us, but they all kind of stayed in their jobs for like 30, 40 years, and that just isn't happening really with millennials and Gen Z anymore. So I think it's important that we get into this mindset and like normalize, like it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to like do a different job after three, five years. Absolutely. Well, Sierra, thank you so much for your beautiful insights. I think you are just so in touch with the human. You're just so in touch with people and the real emotions and and feelings. So I really appreciate what you've shared with us today. Yes. Thank you for having me and listening to my words. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Thanks for joining us here at the Career Studio today. Please remember to join us next week as we begin to discuss our new monthly theme of having a networking mindset wherever you go. 